100 years ago, women and men across the United States achieved a monumental win for the women's rights movement. On August 26, 1920, the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution was ratified, extending suffrage to women. In honor of the United States Suffrage Centennial, we invite you to jump aboard the Suffrage Special Whistle Stop Tour. The Suffrage Special Train will make eight virtual whistle stops. We will visit Spokane, Pasco, Ellensburg, Vancouver, Bellingham, Seattle, Tacoma, and reach the end of the line in Olympia on August 26th. Join us as the Suffrage Special Whistle Stop Tour winds through Washington once again. As the territorial and state capital of Washington, Olympia was central to the political women's suffrage history of Washington. During the territorial era, the territorial legislature, based in Olympia, defined who could vote. In 1854, Seattle legislator Arthur A. Denny proposed an amendment to a pending bill that would have allowed some women to vote, but it failed by one vote. Using territorial voting laws and the post-Civil War U.S. constitutional amendments regarding citizenship, some activist Thurston County women were determined to go to the polls without waiting for legislative action. In 1870, 15 women headed by Charlotte Emily Olney French cast their ballots and had them counted at Grand Mound and Little Rock in southern Thurston County. However, when Mary Olney Brown and two other women presented ballots at the Olympia Courthouse, they were rejected. In autumn 1871, women's rights leaders Susan B. Anthony and Abigail Scott Dunaway toured the Northwest. Anthony spoke on October 17th in Olympia, and later Anthony and Dunaway addressed the legislature in session. Anthony also dined at the home of fellow suffragists Daniel and Anne Elizabeth Bigelow in Olympia, now the Bigelow House Museum. After a swing around Puget Sound, Anthony returned to Olympia and participated in the first Washington Territory Women's Suffrage Association Convention. A number of Olympia women had given the call for the gathering, including Anne Elizabeth Bigelow and Mary Olney Brown. After coming close in 1881, in 1883, the territorial legislature passed women's suffrage. Previously, only Wyoming and Utah territories had enacted women's suffrage. After the success of the suffrage bill, celebrations erupted around the territory. But Olympia was the site of special jubilance. Church bells rang and guns were fired. A formal celebration was held at Columbia Hall and included proceedings and speeches from dignitaries including Pamela Tower Case Hale, Thurston County's first elected woman as county school superintendent in 1882. African American women registered to vote and voted in Olympia in the 1880s, including Margaret Howard and Mary Mars. But some women believed that their victory might be short-lived, and it was. Just four years after suffrage was won in the territory, a legal challenge arguing that women could not serve on a jury came before the territorial Supreme Court. The court invalidated women's voting rights by deciding that the title of the 1883 law and an 1886 amendment did not have the proper enacting clause. Early the next year, legislators reenacted a women's suffrage law with the appropriate title that excluded women from jury service. But then, the court decided that when the Washington Territorial Organic Act passed Congress, citizen meant male citizen and took away women's voting rights again. At the state constitutional convention held in Olympia in 1889, women's suffrage was relegated to a separate issue on the ballot. When the state constitution was ratified, the separate suffrage proposal lost. Washington joined the Union on November 11, 1889. The next year, the state legislature authorized women to vote for local school trustees and directors, but not for county or state school superintendents. 
Most male voters believed that women should only vote in school elections. However, only women were allowed to vote for the selection of Washington State's flower to be displayed at the 1893 Chicago Columbian Exposition. After the ballots were counted in 1892, the rhododendron won and remains the state's flower. Reformers in the 1897 legislature passed a woman's suffrage constitutional amendment spearheaded by activist Laura Hall Peters. The ratification lost by a substantial margin, and it was some years before suffrage returned to the legislature. From 1906 to 1908, suffrage leaders focused on organization, and from 1908 on, they began to campaign again. Meeting at the Old Capitol in Olympia in 1909, suffragists, headed by Emma Smith DeVoe and May Arkwright Hutton, successfully lobbied for a suffrage legislative constitutional amendment. Suffragists set up headquarters at a large house in Olympia. Acting Washington Governor Marion Hay signed a bill in February 1909 that authorized a statewide vote in November of 1910 to ratify the suffrage movement. Suffragists in Olympia were especially active in the 1910 ratification campaign, organizing poster brigades, working on the poll list canvas, contributing to the Washington Women's Cookbook, holding debates, and securing a Grange straw ballot. Notable Olympia activists were Bernice Sapp, Libby Lord, Georgiana Blankenship, Frances Sylvester, and the Reverend H. S. Ginevra Lake. On November 8, 1910, the amendment was ratified by a wide margin, and Washington became the fifth state to allow women to vote. Washington's victory invigorated the national movement since it had been 14 years since a state had enacted women's suffrage. In the sessions immediately after the passage of suffrage between 1911 and 1920, the legislature passed several measures regarding women's issues. Mother's pensions, the eight-hour workday for women, and prohibition, which prevented the manufacture and sale of alcohol, were part of the progressive agenda adopted after women attained the ballot. As a state where women could vote, Washington governors were often asked to testify about how women's suffrage was working. First Lady Alma Lister was a partner in the pro-suffrage efforts, working to gain statements from voting state governors to counter anti-suffrage sentiments in 1915. In June 1919, Congress passed the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution and sent it to the states for ratification. Local and national leaders pressured Governor Lewis Hart to call a special legislative session. During the session, at the Old Capitol, Pierce County Representative Frances Haskell, the fourth woman elected to the Washington legislature, introduced the resolution. Anna Caldwell, the other woman serving in the House, addressed the legislature. So did longtime suffragists Emma Smith DeVoe and Carrie Hill. As the 35th state of the 36 states needed, Washington was the 12th state to ratify the amendment unanimously. Tennessee was the final state to ratify the amendment. This made women's suffrage official on August 26, 1920. Not all women in the United States could vote after the passage of Washington's Territorial and State Suffrage Acts or the 19th Amendment. Many groups were restricted from becoming U.S. citizens, had to meet certain qualifications for voting, or faced other barriers. Women could lose their citizenship by marrying non-citizens in the early 1900s, lifted in the mid-20th century. Most Native American women who were excluded from voting even after the passage of suffrage finally achieved the right to vote in 1924, when Congress passed the Indian Citizenship Act, which extended U.S. citizenship to Native Americans. Immigrant Asian women faced other citizenship restrictions until well into the mid-20th century. Structural barriers that prevented people of color from voting were addressed in the 1965 Voting Rights Act. In later years, the legislature has enacted other measures to ensure voter equality including 
the Washington Voting Rights Act of 2018 and the Native American Voting Rights Act in 2019. After the state enacted women's suffrage in 1910, Washington women ran for office in ever-increasing numbers. In 1913, Frances C. Axtell from Bellingham and Dr. Nina J. Croak from Tacoma became the first two women to serve in the legislature. Reba Hearn from Spokane was the first woman elected to the state Senate in 1923. Josephine Corliss Preston, elected in 1912 as Superintendent of Public Instruction, was the first woman to serve in a statewide office. Washington has consistently been a leader in electing women to the state legislature, at times boasting the highest percentage of women legislators in the country. In 2020, women comprised approximately 41% of the state's legislators, the second highest in the country. Washington has elected two women governors, Dixie Lee Ray and Christine Gregoire. Women have served in the Washington Supreme Court and as Superintendent of Public Instruction, Secretary of State, Attorney General, Commissioner of Public Lands, and Insurance Commissioner. Washington women have also held elected positions on local school boards, local courts, special purpose districts, city councils, county commissions and councils, and as county executives throughout the state's history. Olympia has had three women mayors. Amanda Bennick Smith was the first woman mayor of a capital city when she served in the 1950s. The city's many women city council members include Cora Pinson, who was one of the first African American women in the state to hold the office. Squaxin Island tribe and other tribal leaders reflect the long standing stature of women in their communities. Olympia's women leaders reflect the empowerment and activism of the suffragists who preceded them. Now let's hear from three eras of Washington suffragists and the women who continue their legacy today. Hello, I'm Anne Elizabeth White Bigelow. Welcome to my home. My husband Daniel and I were both active in the territorial suffrage movement in Washington. We hosted national suffragist Susan B. Anthony at our home in 1871 in her tour around the Northwest. She called me splendid. With my mother, Margaret White Ruddle, and 14 other women, I called for the first territorial suffrage convention here in Olympia in November 1871, where we formed a per permanent association to campaign for voting rights. Our work paid off when the Washington Territorial Legislature enacted women's suffrage in 1883. I registered to vote that same year. The victory was tenuous. Women's suffrage was enacted and then invalidated twice during the 1880s by the Territorial Supreme Court. Washington came into the Union in 1889 as a non-women's suffrage state. I lived to see permanent voting rights for most Washington women in 1910 and most women achieving the vote nationally in 1920. Hello, I am Emma Smith DeVoe, one of the leaders in advocating for women's voting rights in Washington after the turn of the 20th century. Disheartened by a loss of a constitutional amendment for suffrage in 1898, women organized in Olympia during the 1909 legislative session. Working with May Arkwright Hutton and others, we succeeded in gaining approval for a state constitutional amendment, and the big brain men of Washington ratified the amendment in November 1910. It was quite a victory. Washington was just the fifth state in the Union to permanently enact women's voting rights, and the first in the 20th century. We joined our sisters in Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, and Idaho, but many women were still precluded from voting through citizenship and other restrictions. Once Washingtonians attained the vote, 
Western voting women joined together to advocate for women to gain the vote in the rest of the United States. I was proud to be on hand when Washington ratified the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution in 1920. Hello, I'm Representative Frances Haskell from Pierce County, one of two women along with Representative Anna Caldwell from Snohomish County, serving in the Washington Legislature in 1920. Washington was a leader in gaining women's voting rights in 1910. After Congress passed the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution for national women's suffrage onto the states for ratification in June 1919, advocates urged a special legislative session for Washington to ratify the amendment, which convened March 22, 1920, in Olympia. I introduced the resolution to ratify the amendment, which passed the legislature unanimously. Washington became the 35th state to ratify the 19th Amendment. It wasn't until August of 1920 that Tennessee became the 36th and final state needed to ratify the amendment, which became effective August 26, 1920. Well, back to 2020. There was still more work to do since not all women gained the vote in the 1880s or 1910 in Washington or nationally in 1920. Most Native Americans could not become citizens until 1924. Immigrant Asians were precluded from citizenship until the mid 20th century. Women could lose their vote through marriage to a non-citizen in the first part of the 20th century. And women in territories also were delayed from voting. African Americans and others were often barred from voting by structural racism addressed by the Voting Rights Act in the 1960s. 18-year-olds got the vote in the 1970s, and the quest for equal voting rights for all citizens continues today. So 110 years after most women gained the vote in Washington, and 100 years after the passage of the 19th Amendment, what does the vote mean to women in Washington today? Hello, everyone. My name is Charlene Kreis. I'm from Squaxin Island Tribe. Our tribe has resided in this area for thousands of years. Archaeologists have found artifacts that go back to the date of the recession of the glacier. That's thousands and thousands of years. Our people have a belief that there are laws of the land. The laws of the land have to do with respect, respect to the items that are here in the natural resources, such as the water, the trees, the plants, the birds, the animals. And it, it goes into our teaching of called Gwadzadet. Gwadzadet is teaching of body, mind, soul, spirit, infant, child, adult, elder, spring, summer, fall, winter. What does this have to do with the right to vote? This is very important for our tribal people. It's the foundation of the inherent right to live, to have a good life, to be able to have longevity of life, to be able not to worry about putting food on the table, to be able to speak your mind or to sing your song without someone telling you, no, you can't do that. For our people of the Squaxin Island tribe, I am a matriarch, meaning I am one of the elders, the mothers, that I do speak up and I do speak on behalf of my people in many areas. When it comes to the right to vote for women, it is almost a sacred right because we are the givers of life. We often are the ones that are there first in the first, when our children get sick, or if our family is sick, husbands are sick, we're there. And we are the ones that are um, watching over, uh, making sure the food comes in. In my society, it was the women who were responsible to watch over the, the medicines, the foods that were in the land. We had to make sure that the foods were harvested in the right time, and the medicines were taken care of in the way that was necessary to offer the greatest potency. potency. The right to vote is the right to be able to have a good life, to have a rich life. Thank you. Hello everyone, I am Thelma Jackson. I have lived in this Thurston County area for almost 50 years. 
In the time that I've been in the state of Washington, I've been very active in various aspects of the women's movement. And I want to talk today about black women in relation to what's going on in the country and the world right now. Because my experience having been involved in various aspects of uh, the civil rights movement, the women's movement, is that I have yet to see fully embrace the needs and concerns of black women um, as we see the list of things that have always been produced uh, when we talk about the women's movement. So I'm delighted to have been invited to be here as a part of this today because I think it's an important aspect as we move forward in this country. Uh, we've been very present historically in the women's suffrage movement going back to the very, very early days. And the women's suffrage movement for us was coupled with the civil rights movement, just trying to enjoy our gain of civil rights in this country. And so we were fighting on two fronts, trying to get our basic civil rights, but at the same time, our women's rights. And so the suffrage movement uh, saw a lot of our involvement by a lot of our early black women. And you've heard about a lot of them over the years, if you're familiar with the history. And so the fight for a voice in the women's suffrage movement and the discrimination against black women within that overall movement continues today. And we find as though we still have to struggle to elbow our ways in so that our agendas and our issues can be included because black women's voices are important as well. And we have found that over the years, black women were left on the sidelines of the major suffrage movement, even as far back as the 1890s. Uh, in the 1913 suffrage march in Washington, uh, black women were actually asked to march in the back of the parade, uh, even though we were, as a group, uh, quite involved through NAACP work, through advocacy work for rights and justice. And even within the ranks of women, we still were met with uh, the same kind of uh, disenfranchisement. And so as we talk today in our contemporary conversations, we talk about white supremacy, uh, and that whole de ideology, but for us as black women, white supremacy ideology has not been limited to white men, and we have found it played out against us from a lot of white women as well. And so thinking back on my activity in 1977 as a part of the International Women's Year activities, I had the honor of presenting, uh, representing the state of Washington as a part of the state delegation in the National Women's Conference. And it was amazing to me just how uh, marginalized black women from all over the country were even in that national gathering of women. And so the fight goes on. We continue to struggle. We continue to uh, point out things that happens to us as part of a black community. Uh, we as black women continue to experience more police violence, less access to health care, environmental injustice, greater wage disparity, and many other challenges than white women. So again, that dual fight continues for us because we have not uh, arrived at the point yet in our presence and nor in our history where as black women, uh, our agenda can overlay the overall women's agenda and we don't have to deal with those internal disparities as well. So now as we uh, struggle as a nation to deal with the systemic racism that's been pointed out through the protests, through the destruction of uh, racist statues and monuments, the Black Lives Matter movement has just taken on fire all over this world, not just in this country. And things that are coming uh, to pass are, are becoming evident. People are realizing, I didn't know it was that bad. I didn't know those differences existed. I didn't know that it really happened the way a lot of you black people have described it to be. But the videos have convinced us that you have been correct and that we must join your fight because your fight is our fight. And I'm looking forward to uh, 
my white sisters who I found much support from many over the years uh, to realize that uh, it's not just my fight as a black woman, but it's our women's fight as a gender that's been suppressed and in, in this country. And so the Black Lives Matter movement is pointing out those kinds of things and bringing a lot of conversation to the forefront that we've never had before. And I really do appreciate the fact that in this 100th year anniversary of the women's suffrage movement that we can find a new degree of commitment to not only talk about uh, the white uh, woman's movement, but the movement of women that involves uh, all women of color so that we can all be women together. So thank you so very much for including me in this opportunity. Greetings. I'm Karen Tweet, president of the League of Women Voters of Thurston County. Like the hard-fought battle for the 19th Amendment, the League of Women Voters celebrates its 100th anniversary this year. We were founded by the leaders of the suffrage movement, including Carrie Chapman Catt and Emma Smith DeVoe, to help women carry out their new responsibilities as voters. From the beginning, the League has been nonpartisan, but focused on issues, including ones not yet imagined in 1920. Catt asked the question, are the women of the United States big enough to see their opportunity? We in the League of Women Voters aspire to live to that challenge, encouraging all people to be informed voters, never endorsing candidates or political parties, political in that we study issues impartially, develop positions based on consensus, and then lobby for these positions. The past century has been one of dramatic achievements in science and technology, and yet this progress and the climate change it has produced threatens our planet and the very future of our children and grandchildren. The people we elect this year will face challenges, new ones and old ones, including the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on government, jobs, and even voting. We face a history of systemic racism and injustice, divisiveness in our politics, and the need for immigration reform and restoration of our planet. True to the League's history, a major focus this year is promoting fair and safe elections, which includes advocating for mail-in ballots that allow citizens to cast their votes in the safety of their own homes. In Thurston County, we are actively challenging everyone to be sure that they are registered, well-informed, encourage others to vote, and to vote themselves. Along with our elected electronic candidate forums, and two new Be a Voter videos. We are spreading the word through email, social and print media, PSAs, and our local access television station, Thurston Community Media. Don't forget to vote this year. And if you wonder what congressional district you're in or have other questions about voting, Google Vote 411 a service of the League of Women Voters. Thank you. Hello, I'm Olympia Mayor Cheryl Selby, and I'd like to thank the Washington Historical Society and Olympia Historical Society for this opportunity to participate in the commemoration of the 100-year anniversary of the 19th Amendment. As an elected official, I understand clearly that a person's vote is truly their voice. It's remarkable that it took so long for women's voices to be heard at the ballot box, and it's a right we should never take for granted. As we head into one of the most important election seasons of our history, we must continue to make voting as accessible and equitable as possible. I'd like to read an excerpt from a proclamation by former President Barack Obama that I think sums up the importance of this time. One century ago, with boundless courage and relentless commitment, dedicated women who had marched, advocated, and organized for the right to cast a vote finally saw their efforts rewarded on August 26, 1920, when the 19th Amendment was certified and the right to vote was secured. 
In the decades that have followed, that precious right has bolstered generations of women and empowered them to stand up, speak out, and steer the country they love in a more equal direction. As we celebrate the anniversary of this hard-won achievement and pay tribute to the trailblazers and suffragists who moved us closer to a more just and prosperous future, we must resolve to protect this constitutional right and pledge to continue fighting for equality for women and girls. In the many decades since suffragists organized and mobilized, countless advocates and leaders have picked up the mantle and moved our nation and our world forward. Today, young women in America grow up knowing a historic truth, that not only can they cast a vote, but they can also run for office and help shape the very democracy that once left them out. For these women and for generations of women to come, we must keep building a more equal America. Whether through the stories we tell about our nation's history or the faces we display on our country's currency. As we recognize the accomplishments that so many women fought so hard to achieve, we must rededicate ourselves to tackling the challenges that remain and expanding opportunity for women and girls everywhere. I will add that the work for truth and reconciliation continues today as we grapple with rectifying 400 years of systemic oppression of African Americans. My hope is that when this program is viewed 100 years from now, people will look back, recognize the historic struggle for racial justice in America, but view it as a chapter of our history that ends in equity and justice for all. Well, folks, that's the end of the line for the Suffrage Special Whistle Stop Tour. We hope you've enjoyed learning a little about Washington's women's suffrage history and meeting some of our amazing local women changemakers. For more information about the Suffrage Centennial and how you can get involved, don't forget to visit us at www.suffrage100wa.com.